I can proceed whenever you're ready. Yes. Uh, welcome to Sports Talk with Kifuen. I'm your host, Kifuen Jabulwaga Masamu. And today I've got a very special guest today, Monde Zondegi. He, this man has had amazing debuts. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you've had what? You've taken a wicket off your first ball when you bowled under 20 in the World Cup. And then you've got a 15 in your test debut. <laughs> and you and he had a long list A career. You had a long one. <laughs> and you still hold uh, the uh, for the most wicked. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Of the season. Sorry, I was going to say that my debut in one-day cricket when I got my first ball, it wasn't at the World Cup. Um, it was, that was 2002 against Sri Lanka. It was like a home series that we played against when they came to Toya. Um, but I did play in the World Cup, but yeah, my first ball uh, in 50 over cricket, yeah, was was against Sri Lanka. But that was when they toured here in 2002. Like, I think it was in November or December sometime. Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. Okay, so uh, let's let's start. Um, what I read was okay. What I got was uh, you signed your first contract at the age of seventeen. And how how was that done? Like, were your parents involved, or were your guardians at that time involved in you signing your contract? Because hey, that if you were just signing it alone, that means hey, that contract wasn't. <laughs> No, I, yeah, because legally, uh, I think at that time, I wasn't allowed to sign anything without um, my parents' consent. So, um, because I lived with my uncle and aunt, they basically were my guardians. Um, I, my uncle had to approve it before I, I um, before Border could actually officially make it official. Actually, the only thing I'll, I'll say about that is I did sign it when I was 17. I was in uh, grade 11, started nine. <laughs> but, there was some money I was supposed to be getting, but I don't think they pay me actually. If I if I think back on that, they didn't pay me at all until I left school. But yeah, um, my uncle was basically involved in the, in the negotiations, if you will, in terms of approval. Oh, so maybe he was like, nah, don't give him the money now; he'll blow it. <laughs> maybe it was it wasn't a lot of money to be quite honest. It was in the hundreds, it was in the thousands at the time. But that's at, back then that was a lot of money. So um, it would have been nice if they paid me, but. No, nah, they didn't pay me. I think for them, it was just made to make sure that I stayed in the border region um, because there were rumors there were some other provinces uh, trying to steal me away. So they, they wanted to lock me down, basically. So what were those provinces that wanted to to take you away from border? Uh, I actually only heard about Gauteng at the time. Oh. That was it. Uh, Titans. Else, uh, Titans No, just, just the Lions. Oh, it's the yeah, Lions. The Lions like. oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that was a rumor. Or oh, they didn't come and approach you or anything. Was... No, they didn't come to me directly. That was just a rumor that a border had heard. So they they got a little bit uh, worried and scared that I might leave after school. But uh, I was always committed to stay at border for at least a couple of years after high school because they'd done a lot for me. Um, they also pay my school fees and they um, for all my medical stuff, they they looked after it because I had a few injuries in school as well, but they, they did a lot for me. So I was never going to leave in the first couple of years. I was always going to commit first and then maybe leave later like I did. Oh, nah. Nah, that, that's, I didn't, you know, so you've always had these injuries, these niggling, you've always been injury prone from high school. Yeah, so I used to have back issues in high school. Um, and that's actually ironically how my career ended because of a back injury. Uh, yeah, so I've always had injuries, but I think the conditions at Dale at the time, which is the school I went to, um, we used to ball on concrete uh, mm-hmm. in the net of practice, which wasn't ideal for fast bowlers and for your body. Um, there was a few guys actually who were very promising, who also had back problems at the time. Um, there's a guy now who's actually the coach of the South African A team in the academy, Malibonga Maqueta. Maqueta. So I played with him and I've known him since primary school that he was supremely talented, but he you know, he, he had back problems since he was 15 and that ended his career early too. So there was a lot of fast bowlers coming from Dale because I think we practiced in the wrong conditions um, that crippled people's careers. Luckily, I was able to play for a couple of years, but they came back to bite me later on. I really didn't know that uh, bowling in concrete because growing up, I also used to play like a bit of cricket and we used to always play in the nets and people would bowl at you in the nets. So I didn't know that uh, being in the nets was actually bad for you. 
Well, the conditions, again, concrete is not good for, for the body because it is very high and it's tough. And, um, you know, they say fastball is put, I don't know, I, if I'm correct, it's like 18 times your body weight on, on your body when you bowl. So um, it is very hard on your body, bowling fast. Uh, and having concrete as as the as your base to land is not very um, is not very good for the body either. So yeah, the softer the landing, the better. Also, that's why oh the nets which we played, you know, where we played. Okay, the nets that we used, it was you'd have like a bit of a crease you'd have, and then the fastball would bowl from the grass. So oh, that's more what you guys yeah. would use in international cricket, or so that you'd have yes, a softer yeah, yeah. landing. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and because of that, eventually um, Dale and Border Cricket decided to build uh, turf nets, which was grass nets. Um, but that was like right at the end of my my stay at Dale. I, I actually, I think my last year only they were they were built, and we might have used them once or twice, but they only got ready um, after school. But they realized that there was an issue, and they tried to fix it. But for some, it was a bit, a bit too late. Oh, uh, that was. I didn't know that. So you guys, so this is a very, this is a very, very great learning curve for anyone that's a up and coming fast bowler to not to limit uh, your exposure to, to to concrete as much as possible when bowling. And okay, I read that um, you lost your mother at the age of fifteen. So, uh, I don't, how did that make you feel? Or how was it like? Because I read that you also went to Zambia and then you lived with your uncle and then you came back. And how was it losing your mother, especially at 15 when you were you at border at that time? Or but how was that? How did how did that feel? Um, I think it's because of the way I lost her. Uh, it was a car accident. It wasn't um, something that uh, we saw coming. Obviously, it wasn't like she was sick or anything like that. So. Yeah, it was very tough uh, emotionally. Um, yeah, it was a very tough period in my life. Um, but the, the, the lucky thing is that you, you mentioned Zambia is that I never actually lived with my mom um, because she was young when she had me. So um, she went to go study. Uh, I lived with my grandparents for the first couple of years as Lalina built in. Mm-hmm. And then when I went to exile for, for a year and a bit, I lived with my uncle and aunt. Um, so when I came back to South Africa in 1990, um, that just carried on. I just stayed on living with them. Um, mm-hmm. So when my mother eventually uh, graduated, got a job, and I was about to like start, I think, moving and living with her, um, she was a mayor at the time, a small town called Cairo, just outside of King Willemstown. Um, She passed away. So the timing wasn't great, obviously. It's never a good time. But I guess the only good thing about um, the living arrangements is that I was already living with my uncle and aunt. So it, it wasn't like I had to make huge adjustments in terms of moving out and moving in with new people. Um, I'd already been living with them for the last seven or eight years. Yeah, but it was still very tough emotionally. I think my, we were getting a lot closer. Um, she was very supportive of my sports. She used to come drive all the way to Cape Town with her friends to come watch me play mm-hmm. at Cape Schools Weeks and used to come watch all my sports and rugby games and local games. So yeah, it was a, it was a huge blow for me emotionally. Um, not sure people ever get over those things, but yeah, there was also some upside to the fact that I was living with my with my relatives. Also, well, it was like almost by design that you you didn't get too close to her, so that uh, it wouldn't, or obviously would affect you, but it wouldn't affect you as much. No, it did affect me a lot because, as I said, I think we, we we were getting very close, and we actually were very close anyway. Um, she started spending a lot of time with me. Um, in the last two or three years, um, as I said, she used to come watch all my games, rugby and cricket. Um, very supportive, used to come to my school functions, but doing award shows and stuff. So, yeah, it was a very tough blow uh, for any kid, especially the way in the manner we lost her. Um, had it been something you can prepare yourself for, like if it was sick of cancer or some disease, then you're, you're given time. But when it's very sudden, then, yeah, uh, it's a bit of a... It's hard. It's a hard, hard pill to swallow. And uh, sadly enough, I I shared that similarity with you when I was actually doing my bit of research. I was like, oh, at fifteen, also I lost my father at the age of fifteen. So also due to a car accident. So when you said car accident, kind of it actually touched home 
with me or actually to me. I was like, oh. And he, my father also was in exile at the same time around when you went to exile. <laughs> oh, okay. That's cool. Really? Yeah, we, we, we're still in we're, exile. What year was that? Huh? Oh, yeah. Where, where in exile was he been? My dad was in exile in, it was Mozambique. He was in Mozambique, not in Zambia. Uh, he was okay. in Mozambique. Okay, cool. Because he yeah. came back uh, being, being able to speak Portuguese. Yeah, the, I, I actually speak, I, I can't even tell you the name of the, of the language of Zambia or the name of it, but I could speak it then. Um, as a young <laughs> kid, you learn very quickly. So yeah, I could speak it then, but then uh, you lose it when you come back home because you don't speak to anybody um, anymore. But yeah, I could speak the language actually. Oh, that's uh, that's nice, and also oh, um, seeing that um, you got uh, a career-ending injury, were you prepared for life after sports at that time? No, not at all. Actually, that, that's the irony of all of this. When you talk about things that end um, very suddenly, uh, like we we're talking about my mom. Mm. Yeah, so my injury came out of nowhere. I, I never since leaving school actually. I'd never really had any back problems. Um, all my other injuries were different parts of my body, but never actually had any back issues. So I wasn't prepared at all. So it took me about two years to get my life back together because um, the shock of retiring, being forced to retire because of injury unexpectedly, um, you don't take that very well. So yeah, I struggled for a while to find my identity and I'm still going through that process to be honest. But I'm a lot better off where I am now than I was then. But uh, yeah, it was a very tough time. It was two years, two or three years after retirement. Because uh, you have no idea what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Because you prepared for like the next four or five years to be playing cricket. Um, so yeah, it was a tough period. And I, you know, you, uh, somehow I got through it. But um, still trying to find my feet, I guess, in terms of what I want to do next. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is a small caveat uh i was i've been like um checking other sportsmen especially in america there's this dude called gilbert arenas so he said when he yeah. retired he used to go uh like let's say there's there are times where he uh, he was actually supposed to wake up so he usually like he had a schedule i'd wake up at five go to the gym at five so now even when he had retired he'd wake up at five and then he'd just sit and then take his kids to school once he takes his kid to school he just drive around drive around and then he'd come back later on for lunch and then he it kind of still almost the routine was still with him because he hadn't figured out what he wanted to do so yeah, so after I retired, I, I, I did a bit of coaching, if you will, uh, with the amateur team. So the routine I kept for like an hour, or a year or two afterwards, um, because I was so used to doing the same old thing as as, as you point out to that, this other guy, Gilbert Arenas. Um, but I don't, I, I don't, and I didn't have kids or anything to that effect. So my schedule was. Um, on most days, I get up and go help out with a bit of coaching at Western Province Cricket Club. I mean, at the, at the Cobras, uh, but the, with the amateur team. Um, but once that stopped, uh, then everything just fell off. I, I my escape, my the way um, I lived my life was very different. Um, so yeah, that was the tough part because you know you used to so used to doing the same old thing over and over again. When that gets taken away, then you kind of feel lost, and that was where I was for a while. So do you think that a psychologist in sports, especially for people like you that actually got a career ending injury, uh, they should have psychologists to kind of help them kind of figure out uh, their next plan or what they're going to do next? Or should uh, players or athletes already have um, kind of have, if this ends, this is what I'd like to do, kind of have a plan or in motion before actually leaving let's say when you're starting out your career i know that you actually have to be focused when playing sports you have to be 100 percent focused but uh having kind of a plan of what you're gonna do next when your career eventually ends yeah so you i you, i think you learn that the hard way sometimes because i i think it's, it's vitally important for um for sportsmen in general to take out some form of studies while they're still playing um, we have, contrary to what people say, especially if you don't play international cricket, you have so much time on your hands because um, you practice for two or three hours a day at the most, and then you have the whole day to yourself. 
you start in the morning, you're done by midday. Um, so sometimes as cricketers, we used to make excuses for ourselves about, oh, I'm tired, I'm too busy. <laughs> we're actually not that busy, and especially in winter. In the winter, we have so much time off because for a month or two after the season, you don't do anything. And you practice twice. Well, actually, you practice once a day, so you have so much time on your hands. So I, I, I regret the fact that while I was playing, I didn't do any studies, especially if you're not a guy who doesn't look like he's going to play international cricket. Um, I would advise that that is very important. And I also think psychology, as you said, is very important. I've read and I've heard about a lot of cricket players who, um, or sportsmen in general, who have mental issues, um, who re- after they retire, their life falls apart, they either get divorced or um, things just go awry because you're so used to doing one thing, you're not sure what to do afterwards or you don't know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. So, yeah, I think psychology and I think preparing for life after cricket more than ever is um, is important now um, in terms of your psych- just to say psyche in general because we all know it's going to end at some point and you're not going to be that old. You're going to be in your mid-30s, early 40s, most people in the early 30s um, and there's a whole lot of life after. So, yeah, um, psychology, studying, getting into a smart business um, or something that you fit, just to prepare yourself for life after Yes, because financially we get a lot of, especially in South Africa, you get a lot of uh, former people, former sports stars or even people that played sports and mostly you get them in football, but everywhere it happens, but you get a lot of uh, former stars that aren't actually able to, that weren't financially ready or weren't financially savvy or didn't plan for the financials in the future so that when they left you they most of them lost like two or three years and then after that it's it's all down yeah. from, from from there yeah no that's that's very true the financial part is also very true because you know if, you, if you're buying houses and you um you, you have cars you got a family you need to keep, up, keep that after your retirement and most of the time most guys you, you go from making a whole lot of money to pretty much, unless you have a plan afterwards, to not a lot. So um, things get tight and things get tough on people. And I know you said soccer players. So I've, I've, you know, we've read a lot about former soccer players who are making a whole lot of money. And after retirement or, or they stop playing, um, life changes and they become broke very quickly after living a very high lifestyle. So yeah, that preparation for life after sports is very important. I think more important than ever these days and people need to be aware of that. I think they are slowly, um, but he, yeah, as I said, studying and, and, and getting into some sort of way where you can finance your money somehow um, to work for you while you're still playing it for I checked one, one of your interviews and you said you're actually studying something. So what are you studying, if you don't mind sharing? Um, I was studying, I did marketing, uh, which I finished um, a couple of years ago. I, I, I sort of dabbled in law, but I realized you know, after like a couple of months that it wasn't for me. So, um, you know, you talked about psychology. I'm actually, I'm doing a, a, a life coach uh, guy that I'm seeing right now. Um, and we're trying to figure out what's next for me in terms of my studies. So I need to find something that I'm actually um, very passionate about and that I will enjoy studying. So I'm trying to figure those things out. As I said, I'm still in the middle of figuring out where I'm going, even though I do have um, a career in broadcasting. I also just want to venture out and see what else I can I, I can get into. But yeah, I did marketing um, for for a couple of years, and I and I finished that. So I'm just looking for something else um, after that. Yeah, because as a sports, we might need sports psychologists for uh, use, uh, for cricket South Africa, really, because whenever we get into good <laughs> positions, especially in the World Cup, I, I really felt like if we we played the T20 World Cup last year we would have had a great chance because everyone was actually in form everyone was actually in their strides in terms of T20 cricket Czech Faf Rabada Lungi was starting to get it to get back but you had Nokia as well you had Quinton who was also smashing the ball out of the field we had Morris also playing amazing cricket so I really felt like if it had happened last year for us to play we would have actually had an amazing chance we would have had a great chance but now this year might be do you think that they're still going to play the World Cup this year or uh, it's supposed to be in India right in, in October um, last I checked um it's a tough one because of COVID again, because uh, obviously India had 
a huge um, uprising coronavirus just recently and they had to end the IPL. So depending on, again, if they can move it, maybe move it to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, um, like there's been talk. I think it will happen. I'm not sure if it's going to happen in India, though, depending on how um, how well it's going in terms of the control of the coronavirus. But again, T20 is probably the best, is the easiest place for any team to actually win something because it just takes one great over or one great innings from one person to win your game. Uh, whereas 50 over is more of a team game. But again, also, um, we've been in such great positions in the past, uh, but never been able to get over the hump. But if there is a competition where we can go far and where any team can win it, uh, it's certainly T20 cricket because it's the easiest place for upsets uh, because of the nature of the game. Speaking about a World Cup, uh, you played in one in 2003. How did it feel like to actually play in the World Cup? What was the feeling in the dressing room? How did you guys feel actually going into the, to the, to the World Cup? Did you guys think that you could win it or... Yeah, I think the pressure got to us, to be honest. Um, obviously, playing at home, uh, we were very excited and happy. We were, us in Australia, were the co-favorites going into the World Cup. We just didn't play like it. Um, we, I, I think, barring Makaya and Yoshua Gibbs, everybody else that was in the park played, played below their the normal standard. Um, so I think the pressure got to us. Uh, we were dropping catches. We would usually take with our eyes closed, um, making, you know, bad decisions uh, and then obviously going out with with, with, with the Duck Lewis, Duckworth Lewis system again, uh, which is our doing, uh, by the way, because we misread the um, the Duckworth Lewis system and, and, and what we needed to get. So yeah, we played badly throughout the World Cups, probably didn't deserve to go through to the next round. But again, I think the pressure of playing at home and being um, one of the favorites, if not the favorites, certainly got to us and we didn't handle the pressure very well. So um, yeah, was very excited to play at home. Great support from the home crowd. Um, everywhere we went, uh, there was a lot of support that, that uh, we really enjoyed, but you know, we didn't play up to our potential at all. How was Makai in the dressing room? Because every time, especially now that you actually get to see more of his personality, especially now that he's in broadcasting, he seems like such a bubbly person he really seems like a very public person, seems like a fun, fun person to actually be around. Uh, yeah, he's exactly that. Um, with or without the camera, and he's, he's always the same. He doesn't change much. He's got a lot of energy, as you said. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's Makaya. That, that's all I can say. And he's got <laughs> a lot of energy, a lot of fun. Uh, there's always a lot of noise when he's around. You, can, you, you hear him coming more than you see him coming. Because uh, he'll hear him. You, you hear him first before you see him, to be honest. So yeah, that's that's just him. There. And he's always been the same. So that's that's the nice thing about that. Us. Also, when you came in, he he was the one that welcomed you to the to the setup because always there's always that senior guy that you kind of gravitate to or that gravitates towards you, and then you guys can kind of feed off each other, or you guys kind of understand each other, or what was the dynamic between you two? Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, because I'd known him for a really long time before that, because um, he went to the same school as I did, um, similar background. Uh, and when I got to border, by the time I got to border, I'd known him for a couple of years. And then, obviously, getting into the national team in 2002, um, I knew him. And I played with Mark Voucher for a season or two. I think it was my second season having played with Mark. So I knew him too. So it was, it was nice uh, walking into a changing room at a very young age and very nervous with two guys that you had played with um, who were established in the team, uh, they made you feel comfortable. So him and Mark Archer, yeah, I, I actually got along with both of them very well. And speaking of you saying Makaya and Herschel were the ones that kind of stepped up, Herschel always had this kind of maverick <laughs> type. He always has, has that maverick in him. One thing about him for, from what I saw, Okay, maybe I saw him towards the latter end of his career. He kind of had yeah. those amazing games when you actually needed him. And sometimes he kind of had those ba bad games. But when uh, when your back's against the wall, I'd, I'd have Herschel starting any day. He was almost like Brandon, Brandon McCullum. Him and Adam Gil Gilchrist were actually some of those batsmen that would actually, you can take them from that era and put them in this era and then nothing would actually change. 
Yeah, he's well. He's he's got that type of personality where um, I don't think he he thought too much about the pressures of the game. He just went out and played his game. Um, I think the World Cup in two thousand and three here uh, was another way of him to express himself. He likes the attention, um, <laughs> and he, he and he embraces it very well. So I think playing at home at the World Cup it was an opportunity for him to shine and to show uh, what he can do. I don't think he. He allows the pressure to get to his head. He just goes out and plays his game, and that's him. Um, I think that's part of the reason why he was so successful um, during the World Cup here in South Africa, because he just plays his game. He doesn't overthink it. Uh, he just goes and uh, expresses himself in a positive way. So how did you go about, let's say, preparing for a match? You know, they say a lot of sports stars are actually superstitious, so they have a routine. Let's say I wake up or I have this one sock that I wear or... Because you guys, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was close enough. I, I, I wasn't that superstitious. I think the, the, the you know, I, I think most people when it comes to sports can be superstitious. Like if you have a really good game, you, you sometimes try to use the same gloves, bat, everything. Or like for me, I remember the only time I remember being superstitious um, was I, I was having a good T Twenty series here in South Africa, and I didn't wash my shirt. I used the same old shirt every game. Um, so yeah, I was a little bit superstitious, but I yeah you know, I didn't prepare the same because every game is just different. But I think you do a lot of mental preparation more than you do anything else. Um, but yeah, there were some guys who were ridiculously superstitious. I think Noah <laughs> McKenzie is a famous guy who was um, very superstitious. Uh, but you know, I think most people are in general. But I wasn't overly superstitious. I was. So what were the things, some of the things that Neil McKenzie did that were, you're like, hey. You know, I'm actually, to be honest, I, I wasn't, because when you play with him, when I played with him, I only played with him for South Africa. So I wasn't actually aware of his superstitions. Like, you don't see it. Um, only when he tells you what it is. And I literally forgot half the things he's told me. <laughs> but there were certain things, like where he puts his bats, um, how he puts on his pads, like he puts on his pad, I think, left pad first um so yeah he was ready he did a whole lot of different things uh keep routines that worked for him but yeah he's the one guy that i remember in the circuit of south african cricket that was always talked about how superstitious he was um but i wasn't really too aware of those things because i wasn't in the changing room with him number one at least i was playing for south africa which wasn't many times and even when you are in the changing room with him you're not really too aware of, what, of exactly what he's doing so um, uh, you started out as a spinner. So why did you change from being a spinner to being a fast bowler? What changed? Um, I, I, I was like 10 years old when that happened. I, I don't think that was like a conscious thing I did. I think one day in the nets you were doing one thing and then you decided to try something else. And then it came out really fast and that was it. And the, the rest is history. Um, I didn't see anything on TV. I don't remember thinking. I think I can bowl fast. I, I, I honestly, it was just halfway through the nets. Uh, one day, Adele Junior, we were just messing around. I decided to come off a long run and, and try it, and uh, it worked, and it came out fast. So I just kept on doing that, and uh, the rest is history. Man, I hated fast bowlers because I was a wicket keeper, and I hated you guys because that ball stings. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a very tough hard one. That, that, like it's, it's not easy, especially when you're young and you're still learning about the, the fundamentals of keeping. Um, it can be brutal for young for young keepers. It really stings. I had this one game. Uh, I think it was I was under eleven, and then uh, we played with under thirteens. They kind of mixed the team, and then this dude, our 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 coach at that time, told him to bowl as fast as he could. And damn, my hands came out as red. <laughs> my hands were red after, that. and I was wearing gloves. But in, I think, in his way, he was kind of preparing me for the next level. Yeah, no. Listen, as a keeper, again, especially at a young age when you're still learning about catching and all that stuff, uh, it's got to be tough for keepers because you have to have soft hands and and all the movements. I couldn't tell you half the things that they have to do to to be able to be a good keeper. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough job for young men. No, but it's actually a nice job because we kind of learn how the pitch behaves, especially when when we're bowling first. I I can can kind of see how the pitch is behaving, where you guys can actually bowl. Well, it's probably the best view to watch the game from, to be honest, because um, you get to see everything really well. But 
there's obviously a lot of hard work that it tackles with that it comes with it. So um, as much as it's a nice view, it's it's, a, it's also a lot of pressure and a lot of uh, a lot of a work for you guys. And it's a it's a huge responsibility. So you need to be able to um to withstand all that comes with it. <laughs> and so um how did it go the meeting that you guys had with CSA uh especially you guys are speaking about in uh, exclusion and discrimination especially in the dressing room how did that meeting go about well we we, we didn't actually have a direct meeting with CSA i think that's done through um the SJN uh, office if you will okay. um the social justice yeah umbad's office so the conversation is between them and CSA and they try to figure out a time when they're going to do the interviews again publicly for the public to see um I, i think through zoom or whatever so that's supposed to happen in july um so there's been no direct conversations between the players and CSA as far as i know it's it's all done through the office so it's done through mediators but weren't you okay but yeah. it was understandable at that time because CSA didn't have a board so now they have a board so it would actually make more sense now to actually have it with them with actually the people that are actually in power right um so again um it's been quiet from my end i i i actually there's a there's been so much going on with CSA that I, it's hard to keep up sometimes <laughs> um so last time i checked it was an acting board i don't know if it was officially the board uh but i know that the meetings are supposed to happen well not the meetings but the, the official um public hearing if you will like the sort of trc of cricket okay. supposed to happen in july okay. um but in terms of the conversations between the players and directly with the board that doesn't happen yet yeah because just uh, they just announced a new president i think today or last night but yeah csa finally I'll check. I, I, i haven't seen anything just yet yeah but i'll, I'll double check I was on the news today. Oh, okay, cool. No, I haven't seen anything. Um, yeah, it's, there's so much happening again in CSA and so many <laughs> changes. It's hard to keep up. And uh, these are my final questions. Um, why didn't you get a second opinion for your back injury? Oh, that's something I, I to this day, will regret. Um, I hate thinking about it, to be honest. Because <laughs> I, I know that morning walk home, and that's why I probably, like, I, I so wish I I I I done more research and um did exactly what you just asked me because Mone Moko had a similar back issue not quite as bad as mine he just had stress fractures a double stress fracture in his back which I which I had on my spine but I also had my um the things in around my back they were also damaged like my disc uh the disc between my vertebrae were, were were badly damaged but in saying that he was told to retire as well by, by the first opinion. So he got a second opinion and they had a different view and he had a career afterwards he had a very good career afterwards actually so i i you know as, as you asked me that question I, and i hate thinking about it because um regret is like the worst thing you can do to yourself uh i wish i had but i didn't uh, but it is what it is um but yeah if i had to do it all over again certainly i'd have a second opinion yeah because for anyone that's young because everyone is always told don't ever take your doctor's first opinion didn't anyone yeah. in your family say please get a second one or was everyone so concerned about your health that they said no it's not worth it rather you yeah i didn't really speak to anybody uh family wise um besides my cousin i think he might have said second opinion but speaking to my physio who is down here in cape town he thought um that was the right decision to retire also i think mentally i might have been drained to the fact that because i've been ha- having so many injuries leading up to that so from like 2008 um i was just getting injury after injury i, I had a fracture in my pelvis i had a fracture in my elbow which i had an operation for so for like two or three years leading up to my back injury i, I wasn't playing much i was continually frustrated So I think a part of me was like okay let me just call it quits because I'm just sick and tired of playing in pain and number one and also physios and doctors and it just became a lot uh, I think deep down I wanted to retire but then regretted it uh, a bit later on but at the time I was at peace with with retirement um I think mentally I was just drained from 
all the stuff that I've been going through. Uh, so, so I think that's part. Yeah, continue. Yeah, I know. So I think that's part of it too. Um, I just mentally, I just wanted a break from the game. About about two years before that, I actually wanted to retire. Before my I, I told my coach I need a break. I just mentally I wasn't there because I was just injured, and I was basically being forced to play through injury, and I wasn't enjoying the game at all. Um, I was taking painkillers for pretty much every game, and it, it just it became a lot. And I, I wanted to get out and take some some time off. So when the injury came, my back injury, I I almost think unconsciously it became like a blessing in disguise in many ways. Yeah, and especially mental health in sports is something that needs to be spoken about. Uh, because look at Naomi Osaka and certain things. Obviously, you guys sign up for certain things when you start becoming yeah. a public figure. There's some there are certain things that you sign up for that you didn't even want, but it's just part of part of the game. I guess. Yeah, because all you want to do is play the game, right? And make your money and be happy. But there's obviously obligations that you need to uh, live up to. So as you say, when you become a public figure, there's certain things that not everybody's comfortable with. Like not everybody enjoys the attention or want to do interviews. All they want to do is just play the game and go home. Um, so there's a lot that comes with it, especially when you represent your nation and you become a public figure. Like some people don't enjoy being recognized or asked to take pictures in public and some love it, um, but it comes with the job uh, and you don't exactly sign up for that, but that's what happens. It comes with it. So. Yeah, that's true. Mental health is, is a big thing in sports. And I think people are starting to um, be more aware of it with sportsmen because because a lot of guys make a lot of money. It's almost like shut up and play because you should be happy, but it's not it's not that simple. So this is my last question. Do cricketers have groupies? Because hey, I've heard a lot of soccer stars saying that they had groupies. Do you guys have? <laughs> yeah, well, any public figure... Um, that's out on TV, like any, I, yeah, for sure. I think every athlete that is famous, I'm not talking about, we're obviously talking about international cricket players. We're not talking mm. about just your regular guy who plays for the Cobras or the Lions. I think most guys who play at the highest level and have sustained that level for a long time will certainly get um, attention when you go out to the clubs or wherever you go. So yeah, cricketers get groupies. I think just read Herschel Books' book, and you'll understand that uh, <laughs> cricketers get good. He wrote a very controversial book about all of this, and a lot of cricketers weren't happy that he revealed some of the stuff he revealed. But for sure, <laughs> cricketers get good. Oh, thank you, thank you for for letting me interview you. And can you please tell people where they can get you on your socials and where else, wherever they can get you on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, so yeah, my Twitter went Monday is on Dex with the CK at the back at the end of it with an S and then Instagram just M's on Deki. Um, that's about it, right? Yeah. And Facebook, just my name. Yeah, name is name. That's something. Monday Zondeki, thank you for the interview and thank you for chatting with me. And this has been actually, it's been very fun. I've actually enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. And yeah, this is me signing out. No, thank cheers, you. man. Thank you very much for your time as well. Eh? Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Stop. Stop.